Welcome to the 24th episode on my channel. In the last few episodes, we looked at the geochemical parameters like the pH, EH, redox potential, and ionic potential, which should have controlled the precipitation of this tertian or lower cryogenian FEMN oxide deposits. The deposits are intimately interlayered with cryptocrystalline silica, jasper, and chert. We know that silica is far more abundantly distributed than iron and manganese in the silicate-rich Earth's crust. In sediments, it gets deposited widely with the hydrolysates and resistates, but it is known to occur mm -hmm. globally as bedded chert jasper layers also, even with the late Archean and early Proterozoic iron formations. The geochemist has always wondered why this interlayering of oxides of iron, manganese and silica visible on all scales, say field scale, hand specimen scale, and microscopic scale, show such extensive geometrical congruency of spaces only in the Precambrian iron formations. Since the chemical parameters required for this alternate interlayering would have necessitated rapid flipping of physical and chemical conditions in the Sturgeon meltwater system. This episode explores the possibility of an additional microbial mediation also in framing it. It thus evaluates classifying these deposits as biogeochemical precipitates. One has been curious about this possible biomediation in their precipitation by microorganisms that have been reported, especially the prokaryotic and the multicellular eukaryotic algae that survived the Huronian glaciations in the early Proterozoic and later even the Cryogenian ice ages. In the Sturgeon FEMN SI oxide deposits, the precipitation of these elements has been during the cryogenian interglacial period, intervening the 57 million years long Sturgeon ice age and the short Merinovan upper cryogenian ice age that followed. The diamectites and glacially scooped striated blocks of the Tonian continental crust interstratified in sections of these deposits substantiate the period of their deposition. What triggered these two consecutive ice ages and turned the earth into a snowball in the cryogenian? Was it because by then the Earth's atmosphere got so severely impoverished in holding the greenhouse gases, chiefly carbon dioxide, methane, and water vapor? Was it despite the more frequent volcanic eruptions and meteoritic bombardments in the Earth's earlier history? Though this extraordinary depletion could partly be assigned to the less effusive Tonian extrusions that accompanied the assembly of the supercontinent Rodinia, the prokaryotic algae cyanobacteria that survived till then should have also substantially consumed the atmospheric carbon dioxide and water vapor. How? Through the biomechanism of photosynthesis that they had already developed 
at least since 1.6 GA, if not since 3.2 GA. Surviving the long Sturgeon Ice Age, the algae faced low conditions, low conditions of oxygen until about 750 to 800 million years ago, when the lithospheric blocks of the snowball Virginia began drifting. That happened mainly owing to the subglacial volcanism in the meltwater and also on land, maybe proximal to the margins of the drifting blocks. That should have increased the carbon dioxide level of the then atmosphere also. This large-scale magmatic activity added the biophile elements also, like calcium, magnesium, iron, manganese, and silicon. Besides, of course, barium, strontium, sulfur, phosphorus, and carbon to the meltwater. From the Indian lithospheric blocks also, the cryogenian magmatic complexes like the Malani rhyolites, Koraput and orthosites, and the Sholayur alkaline cyanides provide evidence for that composition. Chemical weathering of the Etonian crust also should have consumed these heat-trapping gases further, releasing at the same time such lithophile biophile elements to the Sturgeon meltwater. The milieu was supplemented in these elements, obviously by the downslope moving glaciers eroding the crust. Remember, it was the interglacial period. Using the biophile elements, laden meltwater, the algae could perhaps generate the required organic molecules resembling phosphatic compounds, proteins and carbohydrates, etc and therefore proliferated in a comparatively warmer environment. Photosynthesis mechanism. The algae could also trap and bind the precipitating sediment particles in their newly developed organic films. This active mediation is hinted also by the mon-like structures within the Sturgeon sequences, similar to stromatolites referred to in earlier episodes. They have been reported from older iron formations also. The algal monds becoming more common in the younger Merinoan sequences indicate that this was an important evolutionary step in the biological history of Earth, preserved, of course, in the cryogenian sequences. The expansion in the eukaryotic algae perhaps paved the way to the idea current that the microorganisms like the algae mediated in the precipitation of the sturgeon FEM and SI oxide deposits, classifying them as biogeochemical precipitates. We will look at the geological and microbial happenings during the Marinoan, that is the younger cryogenian, in the next episode. Thank you.